Okay. Welcome, young professionals. It's uh, really great to see you again. It's uh, beyond our expectations. And I must say that Lydia and Lisa, they both made us really happy. And it, uh, Lydia, um, we were not expecting so many people come to the University. Uh, thank you for that. Also, we are very honored to have Mr. Virginia with us. Uh, thank you. Uh, you are directly triggered the whole discussion at the, um, at least for me, at the UNSVR conference in Virginia uh, three months ago. Thank you for that. Very welcome. The other senior professionals. Uh, um, I, I'm, my name is Chris Sevenberg, and, and I give a very, very brief introduction uh, on this today's program. But what was interesting to see in the past three days, who have been attending the uh, Adaptation Future Conference? Well, there was a remarkable speech by Christina Figueres, and um, as she made Paris possible. And, and, but she said, we have about five years to really come to action and to really see that changes will happen. And there's a lot of talks, a lot of conferences, a lot of plans and ideas, but where do we really see the change? And uh, so she was saying, within five years we have to really make it happen. And also um, our special envoy, Henk Ovid. Do you know Henk Ovid? Yeah. <laughs> Henk Ovid is, one, is our water ambassador, the Dutch water ambassador, and he was also referring to the impressive speech of, of Christina. And he was also saying, we have to do it now. And the role of young professionals in this process is of extremely relevant. And Mark Arias is also with us. Um, we are very happy that you're here. You lead a leadership program on Monday, and we had a workshop yesterday where we had also young professionals attending the leadership workshop. And you were saying that the problem are not the young professionals, and the problem are the old professionals. <laughs> the old professionals, they have to give room for the young professionals and give them the responsibility they deserve and, and they, they, they are able to, to, to handle. So that is, I think, the, the, the big challenge. Now, what I learned from, um, from the past conferences, uh, we had, in, say, in the last years, we had the group, groups working on disaster risk management and disaster risk reduction, and with another group <coughs> working on climate adaptation. And those two groups were eh, the, the, the very famous word silos. Eh? We have those organizations siloed in the World Bank, in uh, professional organizations such as UNESCO IG. Uh, but what resilience brought to this discussion is they really combine them. Huh? The disaster risk reduction group, they were focused on disasters, of course, but restoring the status quo. Huh? Restoring the status quo, extreme events, that was their focus. Um, the adaptation people, they were looking long-term, gradual changes, uh, completely different ballgame. But now, resilience seems to bridge those two worlds. And what was very important yesterday is that we have to seize opportunities and have a positive, a positive connotation, a positive view on how we should proceed and not a negative one. Now, and I think that positiveness, that's within the young professionals. So I'm extremely happy that we have this, 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 this event. Um, we have a lot of speakers, so I will, I will be very short. The program will finish around 12.30, and then we have a picture where we would like to have you all in the garden. Uh, and we will also briefly explore how we could continue this movement and what you can do to really support what uh, Lydia and Nisa uh, uh, are doing and, and which they really urgently need. Eh? So let's try to close off this, this morning with some 
very strong commitments from USA. Okay? Well, Virginia. so delighted to see so many here. I think the first thing we do is give a round of applause to Lydia and Lisa. <laughs> so I'm really proud of you. But without you, Chris and Case, we'd have never got here today. So a huge thanks to you. <laughs> to me, the Sendai framework is an incredibly magical document. Walter, was one of the negotiators. You should be so proud of those of you who are from the Netherlands. Walter's voice was really clear, but so was that of all the European community. The number of interjections you made that made such a difference to the framework, I think... Shall we give Walter a round of applause? Well, you should know for saying great things, because, I, my gosh, is this a real opportunity. So I need to talk to you a little bit about what we've been doing. Why am I here? Because... Uh, for the current moment, I am the Vice Chair of the UNISDR Scientific and Technical Advisory Group, and I'll explain a little bit about that. But I'm actually a public health doctor who works in Public Health England, who pay for me most of the time, but not always. <laughs> Just to remind you, disasters cost, disasters affect, and disasters kill. But the data on this is extremely weak, very poor. We need science to really understand what happens. This is only over the last 12 years, and the impact is pretty remarkable. But if we looked over 30 years, you can see that climate has changed, or it's a changed climate. We're getting more storms. We're getting more floods. Now, the Netherlands is remarkable for how you cope with flooding, but your skills here and in this centre, Chris, need to be shared much more widely. Your knowledge, your science expertise, your delivery is absolutely critical. DRR, Disaster Risk Reduction, has really only been a commitment at the United Nations for the last 25 years. Before that, it was a movement where we all struggled to cope with it. And I can't believe how young it is. I can't, I can't tell you how surprised I am. So we had the International Decade of Natural Disaster Reduction, which moved on to the Yokohama Strategy. Then you ran the, the, the International Strategy for Disaster Re uh, Reduction set up under Neith Ban Ki-moon started, uh, or the, the UN Secretariat. We had the Hyogo Framework for Action. How many of you have actually heard about the Hyogo Framework for Action? Oh, quite a few of you. I'm amazed when I go and talk to other scientists around the world, they've never heard of it. And I'm really concerned that a lot of our policymakers haven't even really heard of it. Wasn't that awful, Walter? But what we have to do now is make sure that Sendai counts. It's not just Christina Figueres who says that if we don't deliver, we'll never make 2030 safely. I believe it so strongly from having looked at the impacts of disasters locally and extensively. But why 2015 matters so much is because we've got all these three UN agreements to work together. They all link to each other, they all talk to each other, and they're all partners. The trouble is we have too many indicators, I think, at the moment, don't we, Walter? Not good. I think there are 230 for the SDGs alone, so it's really frightening about how governments are going to do it, particularly governments that are resource poor, and so we really need to help them. Negotiation. Well, this is just the one photograph I sneaked out of those many nights, days, weeks of negotiation. The negotiation for the Sendai framework took so long, and each of the paragraphs you will see required a huge commitment from everybody in the room. And as soon as the commitment came, yeah. one of the chairs would go, <coughs> and the gavel came down, and it was ever after, and it was fixed but they were dotted around all over the place. They didn't quite join up, and I don't know how the Secretariat actually managed to pull together such an incredibly valuable piece of work. But without the major group of youth and children who really spawned this idea, who grew it, who said how important it was, we would have never got the incredible commitment from children and youth and recognising that there were so many on the team who came from Children and Youth on the negotiations, some of whom came to camp out on my floor in London, I don't know, they all turned up every so often, 
and I loved it, and I love it still, and they're all welcome me time. So if you ever need to come to London and need a bed, let me know. Um, but my, my real ambition was that I thought, here are these incredible scientists. We need to celebrate them. And it was they who thought, of course we can do it. They who picked up the idea, who turned it into something much more practical. And Olivia, we've been really suggesting this since August last year. And it's been an incredible movement of young scientists who say, we can. We can be counted. And that's what I really want to celebrate with you today. So this is Sendai, an incredible meeting, wasn't it, Balta? What a breathtaking moment. We didn't think we would get to the Sendai framework. You probably heard about the climate change agreement being held on for 24 hours on the wood and should, which one was going to be acceptable, that word. But we had problems with terminology, we had problems with mutually transferable of intellectual uh, knowledge and all sorts of things. But we sat there, and I am only an advisor. It's Valta and the others who come from the countries who actually made the difference. But I sat there and pushed and prodded whoever I could, although they occasionally surprised us, but it worked. So this is the Sendai framework, which was then adopted by the, all the UN nations in June last year. And to me, for any scientist, it is open sesame because we have to deliver all of these. It's going to drive all your research programs. It's certainly going to drive mine, really, for the next 15 years. The real message is it's a substantial reduction of disaster risk and losses in lives, livelihoods, and health, and the economic, physical, social, cultural, and environmental assets of persons, businesses, communities, and countries. <laughs> and that's the short version. But you know, for me, as a health professional, to get health in there, was amazing. For all, we know health can't work without livelihoods and we must keep people alive. It was all focusing finally on humans and how humans can interface, how social science, medical sciences, agricultural science, water science, natural science, engineering and technology, humanities have all come together to deliver this. So we have four priorities of action which Lydia has turned into workshops with Anisha for today. And we've got understanding disaster risk. What do we mean by that term? How are we going to really make it work scientifically? Strengthening disaster risk governance. How do we get governments to buy into this at local to national or regional or even global level? How do we make it happen? And then we have this incredible thing about investing. Now in the Netherlands, your investment for disaster risk reduction is extraordinary. The fact is 1% of your gross national product, I think it's come down to 0.7% now for your flood defences, but it's still an incredible commitment to keeping every one of us safe when we come here. And then finally we get on to this really difficult one, which puts in everything of enhancing preparedness, effective response, to the Japanese message of build back better. And considering the problems they've had with the earthquake and tsunami, and then now again another earthquake a couple of weeks ago, in recovery, rehabilitation and reconstruction. And for us in DRR, rehabilitation was an entirely new world, new word that was introduced, but really helpful. So now, I'm a nerd, I'm a scientist, so that's quite fun. So what I did was to go through the Sendai framework, and I marked in yellow things that might be scientific. So you'll just see three pages. In fact, science is throughout the whole document. And I'm going to take you to this one now, because that gives us the mandate for why we do this. Because I, as the Vice Chair of the UNISD, our Scientific and Technical Advisory Group, are told by the framework to enhance the scientific and technical work on disaster risk reduction and mobilisation through the coordination of existing networks and scientific research institutions at all levels and all regions. So all of you who are doing masters, doctorates, postdoctorates, whatever, we need your organisations as well as you engaged, and we hope that you'll be the advocate for taking the seminar framework into your institutions and really helping us deliver such an incredibly important framework. So to me, I see you as the best example in the world of a bottom-up approach. How do we use it? Well, we have the science and technology conference. A bit of a mouthful. It was the very first of the post-2015 implementation conferences, and I had the challenge and the opportunity 
of being the chair of the organizing committee. It was an incredible experience, but it's mobilizing science to implement the Sendai framework. We produced from it this, the launch of the Young Scientists in DRR platform. I'm sorry, Nisha, it didn't come out very well. But what I want you to see is that there are so many of us who are already there for the first launch. I'm sure there's a better quality one. It got a bit blurred. But <laughs> the point is that you see it happen. And how did it happen? Because we managed to get all these different stages in. So we had Sendai. We've had our Science and Technology Conference. We have a roadmap that is still being agreed. We're trying to set up a scientific partnership to be able to get all the scientific institutions of the world engaged. So far, UNISDR has received institutional calls from over 200 institutions. Some of them include the International the Inter Academy Partnership of all the National Academies of Science, some are really little. But the point was they then shut the door. And I'd like every institution in there who's interested. But I have to, I have to follow UN rules, which I've discovered are very exciting. Um, I'm a scientist and it's difficult sometimes. So you have then the idea of how we're going to get that partnership working. And what we have is the ambition to get to the first of the next markers, which is the global platform, which will happen every two years. And that one will be in Cancun. So here's the roadmap. But what I wanted to show you as a scientist, I don't believe any of us refer to UN documents, do we, when we do our scientific research programs? Do we? I don't. So the whole purpose was to try and provide a peer review document that you could all search. But what I wanted to show you was how many of the young scientists were part of it. We had about 100 contributing authors, hey, and we had 11 of you engaged in being contributing authors on that global peer review paper. Am I not proud of you? So this is taking you to Cancun, and so my view is that Sendai framework is that many of you, you're already delivering it. You're working on water, you're working on social science, you're working on community science in Malawi or wherever you are, and you are delivering what's actually needed at the front line, but it needs to be recognised, we need to document it. So I want to find a way in which we can enable you to connect with the Sendai call for science and technology with your outcomes and impacts to show that they are useful, usable, and used. Because every scientist I speak to says that they want to have an impact on policy and practice and to make a difference. And that's what I want to make sure that we help you to get there. So that's my main talk about Sendai, but I have to mention adaptation futures. A meeting that I think the Netherlands was incredible to host. It was a global meeting. It was really exciting to be there. I only made yesterday. But I thought there were a few slides you might want to see. So you had your incredible Sharon Dijksman, who gave an incredible speech on behalf of the Netherlands and most of the politicians yesterday in the closing ceremony. We had this incredible message about how we all have to work together. I thought that was just a fun cartoon. But what I want to celebrate is that Anisha's presentation was one of the top three. Hooray! Sorry. Okay, thank you, Virginia, for your uh, great speech. Now, the next speaker is a really young professional, and we are honored to have you. Anisha, you are the, the leader uh, in, um, in this, this movement, so the um, floor is yours. <laughs> First of all, thank you so much. I'm very happy to see all of you to come to this event. And um, it would not be happening without contrib big contribution from my colleague here, Vidya. Really. Um, I want you to give um, her a big applause for, for the support. <laughs> and also this, this couldn't have been happening without the big support of Virginia and UNSDR to give us actually a channel to extend the voice of young scientists. We have a, a very great launch in, in Geneva in January 
and I'm so thrilled to see how this support has been so great from the senior scientists, early care scientists, and show that intergenerational, intergenerational collaboration is very important. I just wanted to show you some slides about the introduction about the platform. Um, I forgot to thank also the UNESCO IHE, Chris, and also Delta SKs for the big support for this event. This is one of um, our first events to show actually what is Young Scientist platform and how Young Scientists can actually contribute to it. Uh, Virginia mentioned about a uh, young major group of children and youth. I think it's a very uh, important uh, introduction about the major group uh, of children and youth. It's actually a United Nations General Assembly mandated space for young people. Young people who work in different uh, type of fields, they work as a practitioner, they work as a, um, a scientist, they work in NGOs, so all of young people uh, basically involved to actually uh, do intervention in the process at the UN. And it's not only disaster reduction, but also other processes like Habitat 3, um, uh, WHS, the Humanitarian Summit, SCP, SIDS, and high level political forum. So you can see that how young people is actually really have a big role in, in, in this process. It's, it's very global process but we had actually space for young people to, to extend their voice. Now about the platform. i just give you a little bit of, of story how we come up with this platform. We have this big children and youth forum where Case uh, is all, also there to, to give uh, his presentation there. We have such a massive sessions in children and youth forum during the Sunday um, uh, negotiation in the World Conference on Disaster Reduction. And we saw that actually there's a lot of scientists um, who is also young people there. But then it's it's such a big it's such a big group. And how can you actually embrace uh, these young scientists to contribute more about about science? How to uh, move the evidence base policy making to to the, to, to the implementation of standard framework? So it's launched during the 2016 um, UNICEF Science and Technology Conference in Geneva. I know that Virginia has been pushing this a lot, um, <laughs> push us from behind. You have to launch it. You have to make such a platform in order to young, uh, uh, for giving a space for young scientists to contribute. Um, and it's through all process of standard framework, is implementation, monitoring and review of standard plan, uh, framework. And we, we realize that multidisciplinary network is very important to allow the young scientists from different fields of, of studies um, to give their um, contribution for the platform. And it's, uh, this platform will allow us to give a space uh, in order to bridge the gaps of interdisciplinary and intergenerational issues we want to facilitate the dialogue between young DRR scientists and policy makers for the, in the identification of knowledge gaps in disaster reduction. And the most important thing, it's, it's very micro, but I think it's the most important thing, is sharing. <laughs> sharing what is actually your research about. To identify what is actually research gaps from different best practices, different uh, research that you're doing as a young scientist, and foster this, this collaborative research um, and actually to build the capacity for, for young people in disaster risk reduction. And we established the platform and afterwards we tried to build a, a young scientist roadmap. Uh, we, we want to contribute to the implementation of UNICEF science and technology roadmap, so we built our own <coughs> roadmap which has two objectives. The first one is we want to first establish and maintain this Young Science platform. It's a very new platform. It's just launched in January. We need a resources. Um, we need a young scientist to, to be engaged in order to maintain the platform. And afterwards, we hope that we can build the interprofessional and also intergenerational partnership. And you can always uh, <coughs> find the roadmap in, in our website for the details. So this is the summary of the roadmap. The first and the most important thing is to mobilize and increase the awareness of young, young people. 
I think the awareness side is not only about young scientists. I guess all the scientists um, have this problem um, to actually um, um, contribute to a global policy framework like Sendai framework. Um, not many of them know actually what is Sendai framework. That is, that is a pity actually. How can we contribute if we don't know what is actually the global platform is? And then after that, we would like to facilitate the DR knowledge transfer among the young scientists first, because this platform has never been established before, um, especially for the field of disaster risk reduction. We want to just gather all the young scientists working in this topic and see actually what, what we can contribute. And then after that, we want to provide a repository for showcasing young scientists' contribution. And this is important because not many people know actually that there's a lot of young people, very capable people, doing a very great research, and they, they don't have channel to, to really uh, inter intervene the, the global frameworks. And after that, facilitate the dialogue among young DR scientists and policy makers. The policy makers, they also, uh, most of them are also young, so we can have actually discussion with them as well and see where is actually the, the gaps. We have, of course, two different approaches from science and policy, but we, we need to start to bridge right now. And if you're not starting from the young people, what can you get for the next generation? And then um, facilitate uh, youth lab monitoring, evaluation, and reporting on the Sendai framework. Of, the, of course, this is a very long-term objective, um, but I think uh, if we have this platform, then we have a channel, actually, to intervene each of the processes, the monitoring, evaluation, and reporting. And the next one is support the development of new research agendas. Um, young people are always very good in innovations. I believe so. We are good in, in, in actually um, uh, invent innovation. Um, and that's something that we can also contribute. And in the end, is to establish interprofessional and intergenerational cooperation. Sorry for that. So, okay, this is maybe one of the, the, the last slides. What is ex the, the example of a great contribution for young scientists? We have the DRR working group, uh, who is working more in the policy sides, and the young scientists can actually give um, um, advice uh, for, for the policy makers in, in DRR working group to give them advice on on uh, the points of, of um, policy document, for example. Um, and for example, we were in Geneva last year for, um, for a working group uh, open-ended meeting about terminology and indicators. Me and Lydia was there, and it's, it, I'm thrilled that they actually give a space for us to talk and to say what we think about what, what should have been done in that working group. And we can also um, uh, do through activities like submission of science brief and policy brief and other publication. We want to push the publication from the young scientists. And for supporting this event, you actually already give a very great contributions. So this is the thematic areas that we plan to have in the young scientists platform. I think it has to be mirroring the standard framework, so in that sense, we will really reach into um, uh, a concrete, uh, uh, how do you call it, a concrete suggestion of, of what, what should be added uh, in each priority for action. Virginia has mentioned it already. And why we need your contribution? Because we cannot do it without you, basically. It's only a few of us working on it now. And we, we really need your support. And if you need more, more information, please don't hesitate to contact us. The focal point is me and Pravin Rokaya from uh, Canada. So thank you so much for, for your time. Thank you, Alicia. Very well done. Now, is there is any person in this room who knows how to connect young people and how to engage them in networks? Then it's Mansi. Mansi is the president of the Alumni International. Yeah? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm very honored to be here today and to be invited for this event. And uh, I'm also a little bit sorry that I don't make the youth category anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but okay. <laughs> so uh, I'm 
I'm going to be talking about, uh, because it's about a young scientist platform, I'm going to be talking about the power of networks today. Let's see where it brings. So who am I? Uh, very briefly, uh, I'm uh, an Indian, originally living since 15 years in the Netherlands. I'm here today as president of the Alumni International Board of IHS, which is the Institute of Housing and Urban Development Studies in Rotterdam, a kind of similar institute as UNESCO IHS. It's a center of excellence. And um, we have around, well, I'll actually tell a little bit <coughs> about it in a moment. My background is architecture and urban environmental management and I'm working mainly with climate resilience and water governance. Um, a little bit about the IHS alumni board. Uh, we are about eight and a half thousand alumni growing every year naturally around the world. We have an alumni office which is part of the IHS and then we have the uh, board uh, which comprises of me, uh, Tanya from Philippines, Aveku from Ghana, and Charm, she's part of the, from Philippines also, part of the R office. <coughs> we have, of course, not every uh, alumni is active, but we have quite a bit of active alumni who we have also comprised them uh, into local alumni associations. And we have about 15 quite active uh, local alumni associations around the world. And uh, a little bit of the spread of the map. And uh, what we uh, find is that all these alumni are really huge resources for us, and each of them are ambassadors for, not only for IHS, but also ambassadors for urban change. And that's the reason why we invest time and effort into this work. Uh, well, we do all kinds of things, uh, meetings, of course, but also we uh, have a blog which connects uh, knowledge, which shares knowledge. Uh, we organize... Uh, Alum local alumni meetings, uh, study fairs, career fairs, refresh courses, and uh, we are also working together with key alumni on uh, knowledge projects or all kinds of training projects. So <coughs> they are really our first level of partnership any, every time we go to work in a country. And that's uh, really, really quite important uh, for us. Uh, before I proceed further with this, I would like to do a very quick uh, um, survey here about the backgrounds of the people who are here. So could I ask uh, how many people are here from a water technical background? Well, lots. <laughs> general uh, environment background? Some general environment background, transport, energy, a few. Uh, economics? One, <laughs> two, <laughs> okay. Uh, and uh, urban planning? Also a few, good. Uh, social community planning, I know Robert is, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, there are more, uh, but I just wanted to have a quick survey. And also, how many live in the Netherlands? Great. How many have a, a boat on your roof? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody. How many have a disaster survival kit ready? You have some, a boat? <laughs> well, my father-in-law insists on gifting us a, a, a lifeboat, but he says what's more important than the boat is a big stick to ward off neighbors uh, <laughs> if there's a flood. But okay, we're talking about disasters. How many have a disaster survival kit pack ready at home? Emergency pack, wonderful. Yeah, wonderful. I'm one of the designers. Let's hope you don't need it. <laughs> Okay, just, just to uh, open our mind, we're talking about disasters here, and there are a lot of impacts on industry society. Well, this is dealt, uh, and well, if the, if the diet break, well, it's not going to happen, hopefully, but you know, this is a scenario we could face. This is a scenario we did face in 1995. There was flooding of Limburg, and I mean, these are pictures we are aware of uh, from different parts of the world. This is Thailand, 2011. I mean, the main cause of the flood to, in my eyes, is, uh, is of course deforestation, but it's also bad urban planning. I mean, those are connections we need to understand uh, when we talk about disasters, and I think you do. Okay, uh, flood, money. <laughs> <coughs> we have climate refugees uh, on the run, uh, and I've also read studies that a lot of the problems in Syria at the moment of refugees, it's also based on climate change, with drought and no uh, with, with absolutely not enough water for the agriculture, so all the rural urban migration and it creates conflicts in the urban areas. 
So uh, climate uh, change is responsible for a lot of shit in the world. Uh, <laughs> so uh, this is happening right now. India, a population, I come from there, uh, one more than a billion people, and uh, we have a water crisis, a severe water crisis in the country at the moment, drinking water. 330 million people, more than that, do not have access to drinking water, safe and drinking water. How can that be? Forty years ago, when my parents were on a honeymoon, they saw somewhere in South India cranes which were carrying water from north to south. Today, it's still happening now, again. There are trains carrying 20 billion liters of water from the north to the states in the south. With a huge cost, you know. This is a, this is a serious disaster. So there is, of course, we're talking about water. Yeah, the main problems are it's too much or too little or too dirty. And uh, all of these, we need, we need to work together in this triangle of government, academics, private sector to solve this problem and community, of course. So I have some key messages uh, about this, and that's uh, let's invest in resilience in space. We know that, and this is an example from the Rotterdam Water Plan, and where they make space for water in, uh, uh, for example, underground parkings or in public parks or playgrounds. And well, there's a lot of thinking and planning, and on also integrated planning, which is between uh, eco economists, social uh, scientists, between urban planners, which is done. So it's a best uh, practice, in my view. Another key message is we need to work, uh, when we talk about disaster preparedness or risk reduction, we need to work with uh, visions. We need to have, of course, short-term visions. But eventually, what we also need is uh, uh, in-between visions and eventually long-term visions and uh, intersectoral planning. So don't expect that you'll be there if you start tomorrow. Uh, today, you will be there tomorrow. Well, make plans for, you know, give yourself time. We are, we are only working, I just heard, since 25 years on this uh, disaster preparedness. Yeah, we're not going to be ready tomorrow. But we need to have that vision. Uh, yes, this is very close to my heart, and which was why the survey was also held, how many urban planners. A lot of problems of water have to do with spatial planning. We need to work together. We cannot be in a room talking about water with only majority water scientists, water technical people. We need to be t working together with spatial planners and, and other sectors. Interdisciplinary cooperation, uh, we know that. <laughs> and uh, international cooperation, uh, yeah, well, uh, there are different problems we face, but still we can share knowledge and we can share the problems and solve them together. And this is an extension of uh, international collaboration. This is about communication and participation. So we need to learn to speak the language. We need to respect the intercultural uh, uh, problems and intercultural uh, uh, yeah, yeah, issues so that we can uh, avoid conflict uh, at the international level. Now I'll talk very quickly about the power of an individual in this whole thing because uh, you if you want to lead change, I, I always say you have to start from yourself. Uh, I was planning to have you ask each other very quickly, we we'll just find somebody next to you, and tell each other uh, why are you in disaster risk reduction. Just really quickly, take a few seconds, think about it. Why are you working in this field? Tell each other. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
you've heard from somebody else? Would somebody like to tell if you heard something interesting from somebody else? Would, would you like to tell somebody, anybody, about why you are in... I heard a lot of talking, so... <laughs> <laughs> you know. Maybe I'm going to pick otherwise, you know, and I'll pick on people I know. I'll pick Robert. <laughs> Anissa is in BRR research because she cannot think of anything more interesting to work on. No, that's, that's great. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to pick somebody from the back over there. Watch out. Would, that, would, would you like to tell? You in the Yeah. Yeah, you? I'm going to talk about uh, contributing to uh, reducing disasters. Uh, okay, uh, we can come back to these things when we are in the workshops because it's very important to understand yourself why are you doing what you're doing. So I can talk more about it, but it's limited time, so I'm not going to go further on it at the moment. I'm in it, well, I'm in city resilience because I'm very passionate about sustainability. This has been a, a complete line in my uh, in my life since I was a little child, walking with a banana peel for hours, not wanting to throw it in the dustbin, uh, not throw it, uh, willing to throw it on a street in India, you know, when I'm pa passing by garbage things. So uh, it's, it's, it's important. These are some of the issues which you might uh, uh, have as an individual, why you want to work in the ARA, some of the things, some of the tools which you need to work in this. Uh, it's kind of ge generic and there are a lot more, but I just wanted to name a few. You, you know, there's governance is a factor, uh, knowledge is a factor, uh, money, patience, being mindful about the planet, passion, patience, commitment, and, uh, well, inspiring because you, are, you find it inspiring. A uh, very quick story, this is a friend of mine. He's a three, he's three years senior to me in architecture in India. When, when we were studying architecture, he was uh, very often in jail. We found him morning in jail because he was very passionate about the monuments and the, to save uh, all the whole old heritage. So every now and then he would be standing in the night preventing bulldozers from going over a tomb. And why I mention this is at this moment he's the CEO of the Aga Khan Trust Foundation. He has his own heritage office with 80 people. And this was on his Facebook wall two days ago. They restored, the Aga Khan Trust restored uh, a step well, a Bauli, in, uh, in the south of India. In, in the middle of the water crisis, they had one evening of rain. They collected 180,000 liters in two step wells. And this step well was 100,000 liters of water, which is going to be used for irrigation. It comes from passion, this, this work. You know? Another example, this is a, maybe somebody uh, you've heard about it. I don't know him personally, unfortunately, but uh, you know he's cleaning the oceans out there. He's he's there. He's come up with a great idea to uh, clean up the garbage from the oceans. I met this guy at UNESCO IHE three years ago, just in the cafeteria. He had just won the Rolex Award for Enterprise because at the age of 26 he had already managed to clean six lakes in India, and. Well, because he was walking around along a lake one evening and he found there was just too much garbage. And the government was not doing anything, so he took it in his own hand. He started an NGO, he started a, a community movement, he involved school children, and uh, bingo, he's, he's, you know, young leader. I'm almost ready. So yeah, are you a superhero? Maybe not, we are not, we are not superheroes. And therefore, this is the key message now, we need networks. We need to work with each other. So what do networks do? They accelerate uh, knowledge transfer, tech transfer, technology transfer. We can, uh, we have the golden triangle, which I really love to show every time, which is about the government, the academic, the private sector. Uh, we can share best practices in networks. We can empower leaders, uh, increase capacities. We can use social media. These are tools uh, to have uh, access to quick uh, to have real life data, so it's very useful in a, in a moment of disaster. Then you have intersectoral, we talked about it already, collaboration, recognition, and mentorship. And almost at the end, this is the last slide, talking about mentorship and recognition, 
from IHS, we have uh, at this moment a call for an urban award. We have a call for uh, an urban award, which is for an individual or uh, it doesn't have to be an alumni or an organization uh, by the end of this month. But we also have a youth category award, and our definition of youth extends to 35. So if you know uh, a, a young urban leader who has uh, contributed a lot, please nominate, please talk to me after this. I'll give you the details, or you can just Google it. And the other thing is I'm working at this moment on a mentorship program for the Dutch water sector. So uh, if any of you are interested to be part of this process, uh, please contact me. I'll be very happy to talk to you after this. That's it. My contact details. I'm sorry if I ran over time. Thank you, Nancy, for your really inspiring speech. And it's, it's remarkable how you triggered the audience to start talking with each other. And yesterday you were in a session and you did frankly completely the opposite. Eh? You unannounced, you challenged the audience to start a mindfulness exercise. So we were for a few minutes completely silent. So that's real leadership, I think. Very well done. Before we move on to the second part, that's the young scientist uh, to come to the stage, is there a burning question for one of the three speakers? Not yet? Shall we continue? Okay, please. Uh, I'm very happy to be here, uh, and I would like to thank you all the people who contribute, contribute to this event. Uh, my name is Imar Bahimi, and I, and I am a researcher at Tildal. Uh, my research is entitled Models for the Management uh, of Weather Disruption in Global Supply Chain. This is the content of my presentation. I, at first, I will give you a definition of disaster risk and the different way for disaster risk reduction. Uh, secondly, uh, I'm explaining a little bit about my research, including the research problem, proposed research and methodology. And finally, I will uh, state uh, the relation of my uh, project with Send My Friend. Uh, based on the definition by United Nations, the disaster risk is expressed as the likelihood of loss of life, injury, or destruction and damage from a disaster in a given period of, of time. And it is the consequence of interaction between the hazard and, uh, the, and the features that uh, make people and places vulnerable and exposed. Uh, my research is mainly uh, contributed to the, uh, the damage to the physical assets. Uh, and uh, there are different ways for measuring risk, such as risk assessment and modeling risk. Uh, the modeling risk uh, could help us to simulate the likelihood and uh, uh, the outcome of the events. And the uh, quality of these models uh, is uh, very dependent on the data that, uh, that are available. And how we can reduce the risk? Uh, we can uh, prevent future risk, we can mitigate all lessening the risk, we can uh, transfer the financial cost to other parties. And the preparedness means uh, uh, about the knowledge and capacity of the government and society uh, to anticipate the risk, to respond and recover if the uh, disruption happens. And uh, since uh, we cannot reduce the, uh, the severity of the hazard, the main opportunity is uh, uh, lie in uh, reducing the vulnerability and exposed. Uh, and by uh, vulnerability, I mean the uh, likelihood of the damage uh, or destruction to the uh, asset, and exposure is uh, related to the location uh, and, the, uh, and how much it's valued for the people and society. And uh, let's uh, go back to my research. Uh, the supply chain are uh, increase, increasingly uh, susceptible to water-related hazard. And based on the report by Deloitte company, 50% uh, of business proclaim that uh, uh, the, uh, the water-related hazard impacted performance. Uh, and uh, also uh, in another report by Business Continuity, uh, institutions, uh, uh, the water-related hazard uh, is the second most important uh, disruption in the supply chain. And my research is mainly focused on the <coughs> impact of the flood on oil supply chain. And there are different uh, examples. Uh, there are many examples uh, about uh, the impact of the flood uh, on oil uh, refinery, such as the earthquake in 2011 in Japan. Uh, which results in this uh, tsunami in, uh, in Sendai, 
uh, and uh, it uh, destroyed the storage tank in this place and uh, finally the water was polluted uh, near this area. Another example could be the flood in 2013 in Argentina, uh, which cost 461 million euro for uh, this country. Uh, despite the importance of uh, disruption in supply chain, uh, companies have not yet achieved the, uh, uh, the uh, measuring the full impact of the flood, and they cannot manage them effectively. Uh, and in my case, in the case of the flood, uh, flood trigger a technological accidents such as damage to the storage tank and pipeline, damage to process equipment, and release of hazardous material. And in my research, I'm mainly focusing on damage to the storage tank and pipeline. And, uh, uh, and there is a lack of uh, research in disruption response and disruption recovery, and uh, uh, also in water, uh, and there is a lack of research, in, especially in uh, water-related hazard. And I'm mainly interested uh, to, uh, to develop a, um, a quantitative model, uh, which is the Bayesian network, uh, in order to see how we can handle fraud risk, flood risk in oil supply chain. A uh, Bayesian network is a uh, probabilistic methodology for reasoning under uncertainty, and by uh, uncertainty I mean uh, when there is a lack of data or the relation between uh, different components of the system are complex. Uh, and uh, the component of the system uh, can be represented by nodes or um, random variables. Uh, for instance, uh, for flood security, I, uh, uh, it's dependent on the water depth and flow velocity. And uh, also damage to the uh, refinery are, um, are dependent uh, on the, uh, uh, the flood protection type that, that we have, the filling level of the storage tank, uh, and also the, uh, the flood severity can also impact the damage to refinery. And uh, uh, in this session, I want to explain about the connection to standard framework. Uh, uh, mm, uh, Policies and practices uh, based on the standard framework. Policies and practices uh, should be uh, based on the uh, uh, definition of understanding disaster risk. And uh, understanding uh, disaster risk have different dimension. Uh, I included uh, some of the dimension of understanding risk in my model, uh, such as the vulnerability. I will uh, uh, I will um, estimate the likelihood of the damage to the pressurized atmospheric tanks and pipeline and atmospheric distillation. Uh, I also, if I acquire the enough data, I will also include the location of the storage tank and pipeline. And uh, I also can include some of the hazard characteristics, uh, such as the time of the dam and return time. And uh, I hope that my, uh, I can develop a science-based methodology and tools uh, I, I, uh, I already started to collaborate with uh, uh, some scientific institutions such as CNO, and uh, my final aim would be to develop policies, plans, and measures for disaster risk reduction. And uh, for recommendation, uh, I can say in the situation of environmental and social impact, uh, I'm mainly focusing on the economics, economical impact of the damage, and also concentration on national and local level. My database is uh, mainly in global levels. An application for other industry could be another implementation. Thank you, Shima. Robert? Yes. I'm Robert, and uh, I will start with the thought that ARENA is something where fight happens. So the name of my presentation is the governance is an ARENA for disaster risk reduction, so we're through with where disaster risk reduction will happen. Uh, Hyogo framework for action uh, made the progress in reducing disaster risk at all levels. That's how Sendai framework kind of st starts. It made a progress in reducing the disaster risk at all levels, so from local to the global. But still, there is no day when we can open the news and see that uh, there, there hasn't been any dis some disaster. So for instance, just some examples, Chile 2010, my country 2014, we never had it, be never had it before. 
Malawi 2015. So obviously, uh, disasters are continuing to happen and they are really hindering our progress to sustainable development. And because I'm talking about governance, what I, I really found a nice quote that I like from UNDP that says that governance is the key unresolved issue in both the configuration and the reduction of disasters risk. Mm -hmm. So what is disaster risk governance? Here is the definition. I wouldn't, I wouldn't read it, you can read it yourself. But what we can see is it, it's complex. It works across different levels and includes many people. Kind of in the spirit of neoliberalism, uh, in last 20 years we shifted from the government to the governance. And disaster risk governance goes kind of in three different directions. So it, go, it goes upwards, where mean, governance means that uh, from government to governance means that the governments are sharing their responsibility. So if we talk about upwards, they are more accountable to the global institutions like UN agencies. If we talk uh, outward, so it's collaboration, for example, with NGOs and within different sectors. And if we talk downwards, it's coming down to the local level, so to the very to the very local appro community approach. Because we are here talking about research and we are young scientists, I found handy to show uh, where is disaster risk reduction governance research at the moment. So here is the number of publications from 1999 until 2013. And if you can see, the number is low. So disaster risk governance research is in its infancy and it remains largely, largely conceptual. So we're talking about <coughs> concepts, not really how to bring it to ground. So there is a need for an evidence-based approach. What it, my research is also in very much in its infancy because I just started my PhD and I'm working on Malawi, the warm heart of Africa, as they call it, with the nicest people ever. And also one of the, one of the least developed countries of the world, one of the poorest countries of the world. Unfortunately, Malawi is prone to multiple hazards. So last year, for, for example, they had the biggest recorded flood. And this year they have a drought and at the moment is a state of national emergency and three million people are hungry. When it comes to an institutional system for disaster risk governance, it's decentralized. So this is, a, this is a scheme. You see it's very complex. And I've been to Malawi, came back a few weeks and uh, I had focus groups with the local governments, with NGOs and with communities, and try to shape my research and see what are the governance challenges. And to be honest, the challenges are from handbook. So all the challenges there are, you can, uh, you can kind of find it in, in Malawi. So starting from the DRR is not mainstreamed in sectors, it's not mainstreamed in development. Uh, DRR is not prioritized, there are no uh, allocated resources for it. There is weak expertise in, uh, and uh, capacity of people working in governmental structures. Coordination is a problem in, in all uh, directions. Transparency and accountability that are seen kind of one of the ingredients for good governance are missing. And participation. So doing a PhD means you need to focus on something really, really small. So I cannot uh, cover all of these. So I decided to work on participation. So what's the idea? So this is a tentative title that I will work with, this co-production of knowledge, science, prof professionals, and indigenous for sustainable community-based blood risk management. One of the, one of the motivations to, to choose this is uh, when I was talking with communities and they were saying, if we see ants coming, uh, coming out of the ground, or if we see a hippo going away from the river, we will move, we know that the flood is coming, but if we get uh, an official early warning from the government, we will not, we will ignore it. <laughs> <laughs> and why is that so? Uh, they're saying, you know, nobody, NGOs, NGOs or, uh, or the government, when they're working with them, they're not taking into account their indigenous knowledge. And it turned out in our discussions, that's one of the reasons why community-based disaster risk reduction structures that are being put in place are not sustainable in the long term and they're failing. So you will have a project, uh, it will be done two years after nothing is there because there is no, they are not empowered to own the project. So indigenous knowledge I find really, really interesting and important and the World Bank in 2004 said that indigenous knowledge is a resource for, for the global solutions. However, uh, I will risk being attacked but the literature says by the Western science indigenous knowledge is uh, very often uh, hidden and dismissed, dismissed and especially by scientific knowledge. So what are the, what are the uh, advantages of including indigenous knowledge and co-production of knowledge? 
when it comes to governance. So you will employ local resource, local knowledge, create flexible governance structures, inform development agenda, and also inform local policy, policy making. Empower the ownership, and you make use of informal networks that are many in those communities. How it connects to Sendai framework? Well, obviously to priority action, priority two, DRR governance, and I think it's an exciting opportunity to work in this field because it's the first time that governance is uh, explicitly a priority. So the research mainly forms local level, so I would like results to be you know, used for the local policy makers, local policy making, the nationals, but in the spirit of Sendai frameworks, what was developed nationally or locally, the best practices and blueprint, methodological blueprints are to be shared, so to promote mutual learning and exchange of good practices. When it comes to the science and technology roadmap, so support the stronger involvement and use of science to inform policy and decision making, because I plan to use scientific methods, proven scientific methods to validate indigenous, indigenous knowledge. So what we as young scientists in DRR governance can do? A, DR gover DRR governance is a cross-cutting issue, and, if you, and it works across a lot of disciplines. If you have a look at this, uh, this figure, it's talking about uh, so those previous publications I mentioned, so from which fields they were. So some of them we really expect to see here, like uh, geography for sure, uh, natural resource management, public administration for sure. Maybe we do not expect to see physics, maybe we do not expect to see geology, but they are also there. So the issue needs to be mainstream in all the, in the research agendas across a large amount of scientific fields. And also in the next 15 years during Sendai framework implementation, few uh, generations of us young scientists will be bred, so it's an opportunity for us to, to work on these issues and provide evidence-based research, so not to talk about the concepts, but really see what works and what can help. We can connect, and there is a tool, and I think Anissa did an amazing job in explaining it. So Young Scientist Platform for Disaster Risk Reduction, please join. So I would like started with saying, stating that the governance is an arena for disaster risk reduction. I am a PhD student, so which means uh, I am a geek. So, People have a favorite movie, I also have a favorite movie, but I also have my favorite paper. And it's the paper that, uh, <laughs> it's the paper that motivated me to work in this field. It's uh, in Nature in 1978. It's called Taking the Naturalness Out of Natural Disasters. And it's the, even though today it seems uh, obvious to us, it was then when it was first stated that there is no such thing as natural disasters because disasters are a consequence of so more of socioeconomic issues than natural factors. So strictly speaking, there are no such things as natural disasters. So uh, being, disasters being a socioeconomic issue makes it a governance issue, and governance is the umbrella under which disaster risk reduction takes place. Thank you. Thank you, Robert, for your excellent presentation. Very well done. Now we have our next speaker, Tim Busker. And Tim Busker is, a, I would say, a very gifted piano player, <laughs> but apart from that, he's one of the very, very few young water ambassadors. So he has been enlisted by the Dutch water sector right, to really be the water ambassador of uh, the Dutch uh, water sector. So that's, uh, we're looking forward to your presentation. Okay, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very glad to see that there are so many young scientists here. Um, because on the Adaptation Future Conference, I saw the power of exchanging knowledge and exchanging uh, experience. And then I thought, but I don't see too many young people here, and that's why I look forward to this session, to do the same with young people. I'm Tim Busker, and as Chris already told, I am one of the young ambassadors of the Dutch water sector. And in this ambassadorship, I try to motivate young people and to fascinate them for becoming a part of this water sector. Um, and I think uh, the thing what I want to do is to make them realize that there are many questions and responsibilities for them, for the future gener generation. Because, of course, we make a lot of progress now, but even more questions are raised. How are we going to cope with the two degree temperature rise? And there are a lot of steps to be taken. I don't have to tell you that urbanization, climate change, and population growth ask for highly sustainable flood prevent flood protection measures. And the thought was that, was that human 
interventions, and natural ecosystems are destroying each other. That human interventions lead to climate change, deforestation, uh, ocean acidification, and they all affect our natural ecosystems. But we need these natural ecosystems for our protection. And on the other hand, we want to restore these ecosystems. But we also want to protect ourselves against natural disasters. So we want to protect our ecosystems and our, ourselves against disasters. So I think that it is important to uh, <laughs> find solutions which do both at the same time, which both protect our ecosystems and protect ourselves. And that's why I think that it, most, most of the time, natural, uh, nature-based solutions are very important and can be really effective. That's also what Ibrahim Dion said at the Adaptation Future Conference. He literally said, the message is clear. We need to work with nature. We need to use nature-based solutions. This is a place you probably all know. This is a sand engine. And this is one of the world's most famous, um, famous examples of building with nature. And I was there for my ambassadorship with a Dutch secondary school class. And they asked me, but sir, where, where is the engine? And they <laughs> expected a kind of mechanical engine on, on sand there. And I told them, no, the engine is not mechanical. The engine is the nature itself. And yeah, the nature can be an even more powerful engine than a mechanical engine. And yeah, I saw them realizing that, and that is, that is what I want to achieve as an ambassador, that kind of uh, moment. OK, for my bachelor thesis, I went to Indonesia. Um, where I did research on a small part of the town Batam. And there was a once in a 10 year flooding of one meter on these places. And um, we looked there if we assessed if green infrastructure can lower the water level uh, and also the peak water level. And we made a kind of proposal to, uh, to, to uh, a green transition of the city. So a combination of green roofs retention ponds, bioretention cells, um, we looked if that could, could um, hire the flood resilience. And the result was quite significant, because the water level, which modeled in this stormwater management model, would drop at almost a meter when these, all these measures are implemented. But this is maybe a thing we are all really aware of. But um, I think even more important is the multifunctionality that you create. The recreation, cleaner air, a cooler temperature, higher biodiversity, lower healthcare costs. There are things that we can easily underestimate. But I think we must really, uh, we must not do that. Because one tree provides the same cooling as 10 air conditioning systems. And when everyone in the UK has access to green space, the healthcare costs would drop with 2.5 billion a year. So there are really big amounts, and we must not, this is easily underestimated by society and also by research. Another link to the Senda framework priorities. The Senda framework states that disasters significantly impede progress towards sustainable development. And of course, that is true, we all know that uh, in Southeast Asia, in Sahel, in many places of the world. Um, the disasters, as we saw in the previous presentation, they will still happen, they will always happen. Um, so we have to find ways that we can still develop in a sustainable way and at the same time reduce disasters. And I think nature-based solutions are able to change the sentence towards disasters are able to trigger progress towards sustainable development. When we look to the priorities of the Senda framework, I think it's important that in every priority, we take nature-based solutions a little bit into account. So on priority one, in standing disaster risk, the gap now is that we are not only totally understanding how natural ecosystems work. So sometimes um, we cannot really make a good estimation of the benefits of natural ecosystems. And when we go to priority three, we see that investing in disaster risk reduction is often Often, too, too often done in hard infrastructure because of this reason. And in priority four, I think it's important that when you build back better, 
um, that you also take nature based solutions into account there. Because when you don't do it now, in, in a couple of years you have to rebuild it and the cost of that will be even higher. So my conclusion is that building with nature provides sustainable and multifunctional flood risk solutions. And it is it's crucial, in my opinion, to implement this in all four SENDA priorities. So not only to priority three, but I think you have to take it in all priorities into account. Um, and research more and more refuse the economic benefits, but society often still underestimates this benefit. And um, still a lack of knowledge exists, and also research is not able, sometimes not able to quantify the benefits, uh, and this can hamper cost-benefit analysis, and uh, hence can also hamper decision-making. Thank you. Great lesson, eh? Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Okay, thanks uh, a lot, Tim. The last speaker, Bejardo. here at UNESCO, and now I'm a PhD student at TU Delft. And between my master and my PhD, I was lucky and I was part of this program called Young Extra Program, and that is one of the topics that I want to talk about. Actually, this is a good opportunity uh, for young people that want to be involved in water. And as you see, in the you can read in this slide, is uh, for people that and w that want to work in the water on the output sector. So this is um, uh, the you can apply to the Dutch company. Okay. So the the procedure is like that: you apply for a Dutch company, and you can work uh, abroad in one of the countries that uh, uh, this Dutch company have some uh, project working. So if you want more information, you can go to the we this website. And you can write an email to the people in charge. And for sure, they're going to give you an answer. Uh, this is the applicant. So this is all the company uh, which you can apply. This is a lot. Uh, also, so today, so you can see that the, there's a lot of young water experts around the, the world, mostly located in Africa and, and Asia. But also, there's one project going in Colombia. So it's possible for apply for Latin people to, to this project. Okay, so you can see nowadays it is uh, 16 young experts in agro food, and this is around 131 young experts in water. Uh, so there are six thematic areas uh, of so new water. Uh, this is the efficient water management, uh, most uh, focusing the agricultural sector, also improved river basin management and safe structures access to safe drinking water and sanitation, and also other food. See, see, this is a, I think that this is quite a new program. It's a begin with two years ago. Uh, so you can read it, sorry. Uh, but the, the, the idea that I came here is that, uh, for example, as I say, I was a master student here. So I didn't know what to do after my master. So I come back to my country. So I find this opportunity. So from some of you that maybe will be in the same situation will be a nice opportunity. Also, the apply for local, that is called from people that belong to the country where the project is going, and also for people that are from the Netherlands, of course. So uh, this is a nice opportunity. Actually, uh, this will, let's say, like a break between my master and my PhD. So they give me some energy to continue with my PhD after, <laughs> after work. So, uh, now I need to talk about, I hope that was clear anyway, you can uh, go to the website and you can ask to the people in charge, okay? And I say it's a nice opportunity, okay? So now I need to talk about my research, okay? Uh, let me go a bit, um, oh, I don't find it. Thank you. 
Okay, uh, one thing, three days ago I didn't know anything about this enzyme framework, but Linda, Linda uh, Lindsay sent me uh, a document, so let's say I'm the less expert here talking today, so that means I will learn a lot as well. Uh, my doctoral research is about the uh, arsenic removal for drinking water in rural communities in my country. Okay? Uh, and I'll say I'm um, to the uh, Just to give you some background, arsenic is extremely poisonous. Actually, it's considered like the most can cancerous natural uh, component that you can find in the water. Okay? So, the World Health Organization recommends that you can drink water. Uh, with a con uh, concentration less than 10 micrograms per liter. And in 1996, in Nicaragua, was reported the first documented case of arsenic poisoning in the community. There was around 150 people were drinking water with arsenic in the rural community. And the concentration was up to more than 1,000. That is, was more than 130 times the amount that you can consume. So as a consequence, you can see this horrible picture. This picture belongs to a kid that was around three years old. And this picture belongs to the mother of the kid. Actually, in the time he, she was pregnant. I cannot show the whole picture but for some reason, but uh, I'm really horrible. So this is uh, the name of this uh, disease. It's macular enteratosis. Of course, this is uh, not the complete picture because the people that, co that uh, drink water with arsenic can, con can have cancer. That is one of the consequences that you can have with you drink this. Uh, as I mentioned, my research is about water treatment. Okay? But I understand perfectly that the technical part is not the solution of the problem. Okay? We, in Nicaragua, we tried to implement some technical solution at the Kanchan filter, but it didn't work. They didn't work. I mean, could be a mix of the technical part that doesn't work, but also it's a mix of the implementation of the system. I mean, it's the problem with the strategy of the how they implement this uh, treatment system. So one of my goal in my research is not only to develop the knowledge of the skills that we have nowadays in Nicaragua, but also to, let's say, to push to the people that are in charge and take decisions uh, I wonder they saw that we have a real problem. We have 20 years with this problem nowadays. But so far, we don't have a, a clear strategy how to deal with this problem. Nobody knows how to do it. And I think that nobody is paying attention to this problem. So uh, I like this term from the Sendai framework that is built back better. So how this horrible experience can help us to understand that that can happen in the future if we do not pay attention in this moment, if we don't develop a strategy and try to solve it from the roots. So, yeah, I think that that's it. Uh, thank you for the attention. Thank you very much, Mayero, for your inspiring talk. So, we will have uh, a short break now. Uh, ten minutes, and then we have the breakout sessions in four rooms. One session will be here, and three uh, just outside. So let please uh, stick to the time. It's now five to eleven. So five past eleven, we will be back. Is it okay? Okay. Good luck.
Good morning. So here we're focusing on the priority for action four in the Sendai framework. There's lots of other things within um, within pri priority for action four, but we're focusing on early warning. Um, my name is Lydia. I work at Altaris together with Case and Dana and Femke. And that's it, I think. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm excited that, that you're here today for this uh, interesting breakout on uh, early warning. Uh, just so we have a bit of a background, are any of you currently doing PhDs or MSCs on this topic? Yeah? Okay. And the others, what's the interest in early warning or you're interested in learning about it? Are you have, yeah? You can explain yeah, what we're doing. Yeah, he's doing also and um, we're doing plot risk management. Okay, yeah. The master here in IT. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Great. Okay. So I'm going to start. So what is early warning? So in the handout, I also thought I had a handout on my slides, but it doesn't matter. Um, so what is early warning? So on the first page of the handout, you'll see from the terminology, um, open working group, which is happening within UNICEOR to update these terminology. So that's what uh, Virginia, the first speaker, she's been heavily engaged in, in adding input into it, how we define these different things. So uh, this is the definition from, um, that's being negotiated now, let's say, in these intergovernmental processes. And there are two definitions on the first page. The second one is the one that WMO was trying to push for, and the other one is the kind of current one that's being a bit adapted. So just so you know that this is, these definitions are not just you know, easily defined by scientists. It's like a UN process where they really have to fight. That set of capacities and processes gets in there instead of something else. So it's just interesting uh, for you to know how this works linked with all this policy stuff. But back to the point, what is early warning? So WMO says it's a set of capacities and processes that are needed to generate, disseminate and use accurate, actionable and inclusive warning, and warning information that basically enable people to take action, which is going to reduce their losses to lives and livelihoods. And there you can see some examples of types of actions that people can take with uh, early warning information. This is really what you want to achieve, is that people actually do something with this information. And early warning has also within the definition, and that's like the sub-paragraph that's, um, that's being also put into this terminology, is that there are four key components of early warning. So you've your risk, and all, risk knowledge and analysis, that you really need to collect your risk information. So this is your basic um, exposure data, your um, hazard, your flood risk maps, this type of thing. Um, your vulnerability data at the community level, at the national level, you really need to collect that knowledge. And then you have your monitoring warning service, which is more your real-time service, and this is where you'll have your models, your data, uh, your real-time data coming in from the meteorological forecasts, and you're putting that all together to generate an actionable warning, a warning that can actually be used uh, by the communities at risk. And then you have to disseminate that warning, so many different ways that you can disseminate the warning, uh, mobile services, face-to-face, uh, -face, sirens, um, Rickshaw drivers walking around, many different ways that you can communicate, so you have to try and optimize so that you try and make it as in inclusive as possible so that the warnings get to everybody at risk. And then response capability is making sure that the preparedness plans, the emergency plans are in place so that when people do get the warning, they understand it, that they actually have the capacity to be able to respond to it and to save lives, save livelihoods, so that there is actually a boat there that they can get on if they want to evacuate. Or there is a shed, there is a shed where they can bring their cattle um, to save the cattle from the rising floodwaters, for example. So these are the four key elements, and this is what we're going to focus on throughout the workshop. So already you can start thinking based on your skills, where do you think you fit? So which one, where do you think the main gaps are in early warning? Because we're going to group you up in a little bit. Oh yes, and also other thing is coordination within and across sectors, and this links a lot to Robert's presentation on the governance. So this is a huge component also within early warning. And also what's really important is that we learn from early warning experiences. So when there are events that we're getting feedback, we're, getting, we're evaluating things, we're, we're understanding how much people did save, how, much, how many lives were saved because of this early warning, so that we can use that to then build more effective systems. So that's really important. Um, then to link this to the, the Sendai framework and the targets and indicators, which are in the Sendai framework. So there are, we didn't go into this so much in the, in the, in the opening um, presentations, but within the Sendai framework, there are seven global targets, and one of them is specifically on early warning and risk information. So this really prominently puts early warning there, saying, okay, this is something we really have to achieve, that every country needs to substantially increase their availability and access to multi-hazard early warning and disaster risk information. 
by 2013, and they highlight a number of different uh, target, a number of different indicators. And Kate, who's here, is actually involved in this intergovernmental process where they sit in Geneva and they discuss, likely discuss over that terminology, how to define early warning. They discuss over these different indicators, and this is where us as scientists can actually also have have a role. I was there with Anisa in, in November, and we could give input into this to say, no, this is wrong or this is not good. So it's really there's really a role for your scientists to play, which is great. So here you can see different types of indicators. I tried to link them again to those four components. So you can see it's again linked to risk information, number of countries that have their monitoring and forecasting system in place, number of people who are actually covered and have access, and number of governments that have prepared these plans. So this shows you how complicated early warning is. You need to have capacity in all of these different components in order to deliver an effective system. And just so you, I don't know how familiar, I think a lot of you are familiar with the types of tools and, and agencies and partners that are involved in early warning, but just to give you a brief overview. So in terms of tools for forecasting and monitoring, Deltaris is very engaged. We have the Delphi system. Mika is our expert. <laughs> um, we also have Fuse Risk, which Femke is working more on, and Dana, um, which tries to work on translating that uh, yellow box and the blue box to understand uh, inundation and what type of impacts they're actually going to be um, if you have a certain forecast. Uh, there's a lot of new satellite information. Another colleague, Joost, was here who's working a lot on using satellite information to produce risk information. Um, ICT and communication systems, we're all on social media now. There's a lot happening um, and we need to find out the best way to use that as part of early warning systems. There's a lot of detailed modeling going on, so a lot of data coming. Um, in Deltaris we're working on the global models, but then also you want really local models if you want to get detailed information. And also stakeholder engagement tools are needed. So we need to really understand the needs of the community in order to define uh, the best type of warning message, in order to define the best communication medium. It's really important that we uh, work closely with the stakeholders. In terms of research projects, maybe I think a lot of you are even working on these type of research projects, but the EU FP7 projects would always have a strong component in early warning. Um, your national science foundations can be uh, really pushing this agenda as well and funding research on early warning. A lot of NGOs are really active in uh, early warning. So there are programs like BRACE, it's a new one, Partners for Resilience, Forecast Based Financing by the Red Cross Climate Centre. These types of programs are really taking a bit more of the bottom up approach. So they're really working with the communities to make sure that they're able to respond and that they understand the warnings. And then often a lot of the EU focus be more on the technology and the tools and trying to make sure that the science is there to support the NGOs to do these kind of bottom-up approaches. And the big agencies that are involved is the World Meteorological Organization, so their, their mandate is uh, focusing on early warning, and they're also very active in this uh, Senda framework process, uh, the Science Technology Conference, these intergovernmental working groups. They're providing input to make sure that what's written in there reflects what they, their experiences from early warning. Uh, all over the world. Uh, world Bank is funding a huge amount of projects uh, on early warning, so really building capacity of, especially Southeast Asia right now, Patricia has been working on proposals, I've been working on proposals, there's a lot being done now in uh, all over the world being funded by the World Bank, so it's really uh, important that we try and build the best science so that we can put that into these types of projects. There's a lot of donors linked also to the NGOs that are, that are funding this type of work. Um, yeah, so that's just a bit of an overview. Maybe you have more ideas uh, on different types of actors. Do you have any ideas on other people, something you've missed, some really amazing tools or projects? I'm talking a lot, so I should <laughs> just stop. <laughs> no? No? Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so here I want you to think about um, what are the different research gaps? Uh, okay, I think I wrote that wrong. I think I was half asleep. <laughs> uh, what are okay? What are your different research gaps uh, in each of these four components? And what what kind of a role can we uh, play as young scientists in trying to uh, bridge those gaps and fill those gaps? And it's important to think about your own context and what you could do, maybe in your own country or within your own research. It doesn't have to be uh, in your own country. Um, just think about how you could contribute. So I want you to keep that in the back of your mind. Um, and we'll try and split into groups. We won't do the actual group work yet, but I want you to try and muddle around and get into, uh, get into some groups. So if you have to place yourself, because you all gave very nice input uh, before the session in your sign-up form, and you all mentioned specific topics, which I have hidden in the slide, but I didn't want to show it yet. But just see if you remember which, uh, which components do you think that you fall under. 
under these? And where do you think that your skills or your capacities can uh, contribute the best towards improving um, one of these components of every morning? Hopefully we get a kind of even distribution. Yeah? Yes, yeah, yeah. So maybe we can put like one, two, three, four, or what do you think, Mika? It's a horrible room. If you don't form groups themselves, we have a way of forming groups in it. Yes. <laughs> Which is non democratic and autocratic, so it's better to choose yourself. Is it? Do you have no, strong opinions on what, which one you think? Yeah. Uh, I, would, I would like to choose responsibility because you know, if you know how people will respond, then you can make efficient yes. and evacuation. Yes. So I think it's really essential. Yeah, great. Okay. Anybody going to join Imra on response? Yeah. Nifty, right? Okay, Nikki. And you have something coming up. What? Which one are you? This thinking? is my response. Look at that. <laughs> okay. And you? Yeah. Hi, I'm doing research in London in the morning service. Yes. All Great. right. I remember monitoring your morning. <laughs> okay. Who's gonna join the uh, monitoring in the morning? Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, so then you're gonna move more closely. <laughs> you need the communication. Communication. Negative communication. No communication. And what okay. we can also do is, is see. Maybe you can move so maybe, uh, more yeah. here. With knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> With knowledge. Yeah? yeah? <laughs> there we go. So this is good. Oh, and then you need your associated sticky notes. Sticky notes. Color coded, as always. Blue, blue, blue. Yeah? You're blue, great. Blue. Who is. I think uh, communication. Who is communication? Uh, yeah. Blue. That's blue. Yeah. Your yeah, green. 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 green, green, green is there. Yeah. yeah. And yellow is with knowledge. Uh, I just handed out uh, yellow. Oh, uh, that was a different yellow. So that's green. Is that green? Uh, yeah, that's yeah, green. Greenish. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, okay. Anybody else with knowledge? Were you? Which one are you? In. Okay. We need to strengthen uh, communication. No, we need to strengthen. Um, uh, Ah, no. Which knowledge? Yeah. This is interesting. It's interesting. Just, no, no one wants to know and no one wants to talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Okay. to do the, the real work, I want you to, I'm going to present just two slides, and it's just an example from Mauritius on, on the type of gaps and challenges that they have uh, as part of their early warning system. So we look at these slides, and I'm going to present, and think about your color. So think about, okay, what were their challenges for yellow, what were their challenges for blue, okay? I have to go Okay, so this is the results of just a stakeholder workshop that I did in, in the Paris when we had some visitors from uh, Mauritius. We have one project uh, going on in, uh, in Mauritius where we're improving their storm surge forecasting system, but I did a kind of assessment of their overall capacity in early morning. And I used some sticky note madness a bit like what you're doing now. So here we go, yellow, 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 yellow. okay. <laughs> so here are the challenges that they had. Oh no, so the current system, okay. So um, they have a good digital elevation model, so they have something. Maybe it's not the best, but they have something. They have a census data. Oh, there's a skip missing. Um, they have a storm surge inundation map. They have a disaster lo loss database. They have some hazard maps available. And they have plans to set up GeoNode. This is something uh, that the World Bank is working on a lot to try and um, help different organizations to share spatial data. And that's really important to share the data, for example, between the Disaster Management Authority, who is usually in charge of the other one, uh, with the Hydrometeorological hydro Organization, who is usually in charge of the group. Um, so then so yeah? I have absolutely zero experience with yeah. any of this. But yeah. I sort of think I missed GIS. Is that something that could be... The mapping? Yeah, so that can be part of your risk knowledge. So what you... Yeah, they should have some capacity on, on GIS, I can imagine. But yeah, here what you want is to be able to produce those kind of risk maps. And these things like GeoNode, that's yeah, for the GIS oriented. Yeah, exactly. It produces these spatial layers, and then they can use that in GIS. So then for the green, what they have is a good cyclone forecasting, a good monitoring network. Um, they have a storm surge system, which was recently set up by Del Paris. 
Um, so they're doing okay. Um, in terms of communication system, they have a good basic warning dissemination, so email, fax, website, radio. Um, they run an interactive voice response service, so this is where you call a number and then uh, you can get the forecast available. So you'll see the challenge linked to that. But it's good that they have it, but of course there are challenges. And they use flags for cyclone warnings, they use sirens and megaphones for tsunamis, they're trying to develop a mobile application, they piloted the use of SMS, um, and they disseminate their warnings in four languages, which is very, uh, very good. So here you can see the kind of, you know, they're building up their capacity, they're working hard, they're really trying to, to improve their warning system. Uh, they're also trying to improve their response. Where is response? Here. Yeah. So they have good awareness programs for schools, which is a really nice uh, measure that they can take. They're building shelters. They have strong assistance from the private sector uh, in terms of response, so mobilizing the boats or mobilizing the resources um, once the event is going to happen. Evacuation maps and training drills are under development. So again, they're really working hard. They're building up their capacity, but they still have challenges. So here we present more of the gaps. So limited sharing of, of data, and that's why the geo node is being developed there. So it's really difficult to share the data between the different organizations. And they have no central database to update this risk information. So a lot of projects produce risk maps on a project-to-project -project basis. And often what the government does is they don't ask for the spatial data. They just ask for the map. They have the map, they're great, happy. But that, they, that can't be used, that can't be shared between organizations. So really what they're trying to do now is to create these kind of central databases where you can share data among organizations easily. They need more detailed property data. So this is a huge challenge again. They have sea surge inundation maps which need to be linked to storm surges inundation maps. So yeah, I'm not, you know more about this. Maybe maybe I will know more about this. <laughs> um, limited information available on the impacts of the different hazards. So, so more on the uh, vulnerability and what actually will happen if this level of water goes to this area. Um, in terms of monitoring and warning, the challenges they have is the warning thresholds, so when it's going to be red, when it's going to be green, um, need to be defined with multiple stakeholders and be more impact based. So that's creating that link to this yellow. So they need to use all of this impact information that hopefully you can collect from the yellow part and use that in the blue part. Um, human capacity in the MET services, this is a global challenge. Um, often they only have a couple of people working in the MET, in the MET services. Um, Modeling stuff, I don't know the details. They need a better radar, you can come out of the prediction, you could have <laughs> um, Increase the number of automatic river gauges. So the data collection, often there's not enough data. Um, to produce these localized uh, specific warning messages or localized guidance information. And so those are challenges in that part. So then in the pink, so communication and warning, communication and dissemination, um, it's really difficult to manage phone calls from citizens. So actually, there's a phone number on a website somewhere where they can get through actually to somebody quite high up in the MET services. So what happens is if somebody gets that phone number, everybody starts calling that phone number. Just to confirm, just to see, okay, what, what's going on? No, 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 no. And that's really hard to manage. It's the same problem in Bangladesh. Uh, they used SMS, but the network was overloaded. So technology problems. They just can't disseminate all the SMS that they want to disseminate. Uh, sirens and megaphones are being used for one hazard, but not for another. So it's not all integrated. So People are used to hearing a siren for a certain hazard and another uh, method for another hazard, which can also be quite confusing. Um, the interactive voice response service, so the one where you call a number, um, it has four different numbers for different mobile phone networks. So this is another challenge. So if you're on Vodafone, you have to send one number. If you're on GBN, you have to send another number, which is a complete nightmare. So you need these kind of legal frameworks inside that say, okay, no, this is for Disaster management, this needs to be one number. So you really need that political uh, pushing to get that happening. Uh, and again, the legal framework for the social media, they're not actually allowed to set up a social media page as the MET service. And in terms of how can they really reach everybody with all these different mechanisms? So they're trying, they're really trying, but they come across challenges. And in terms of response, um, so they're give, give, giving out warnings, but it's not resulting in enough action. So how can, how can we improve that? Um, they need more interactive materials, so they're, they're focusing on the schools um, to increase awareness amongst the public, and that was something which came up a lot in, in also your, your feedback. Um, legal frameworks to stop fishermen going, going fishing during da dangerous conditions. So actually, the fishermen just want to fish because they have to fish for their livelihoods, but they want to be able to stop them, really, because their people are dying. Um, and disaster management planning, evacuation, uh, response plans is really needed at the local level. So these are the type of 
Um, yeah, this is kind of an overview of the current system and the challenges that they're that they're having. So now, I want you to think about it. Yeah, for the whole country or uh, for Mauritius? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so uh, Deltaris worked on, there's three islands in Mauritius. So there's one big one and then there's two little tiny ones. So there's forecasts available for each three, at least one that Deltaris was working on. So it, it covers three islands. So that's another challenge actually for communication and dissemination is for islands. And, and uh, do you know why they want uh, less than one meter topographic data? Because one meter is pretty big. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a small island, that's right? yeah. like 30 kilometers or something. So. Yeah. Otherwise, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't remember the details, but I guess they need, yeah, they want to produce more localized. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay, so now I want you to think, think back to what you wrote in, in, the, in the registration form and think back to what you've learned for, from each of the different colors and to think about uh, different research gaps that you see um, in order to be able to uh, produce good risk knowledge, a good monitoring and warning system, good communication and dissemination and response. So on your stickies, you can write down loads of them, and then together I want you to prioritize one, and then we'll just feed back and talk about it uh, to each other. Yeah? yeah. Any suggestions, Rika? Well, maybe just to add something, because yeah. when, when you when you look at a, a number of these, let's say, challenges that yeah. Lydia just uh, portrayed, there's some you know organizational challenges, yeah. and there's some technical challenges. Yeah. And maybe just just food for thought when you write something down, I mean, now one could be there. Buy a weather radar, great, you know, you yeah. just buy it. But also have a little think of what do we need to make it work? Also. Yeah. Just to extend it. Is it just technical or could it? Uh, just yeah. give you uh, an idea. And so focus that also, think about you as a young scientist. So, yeah. what yeah. could you tackle as part of a research program, as part of a PhD, as part of the thesis, um, to try and bridge some of these gaps? But that's going to be the next part. So, first, we want you to think about the gaps prioritize one, and then one gap from each of the four, we're going to try and work out in detail with the time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How much time are this um, This is just a, uh, maybe three minutes? Five three minutes. minutes? Five minutes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just work, work, work. Maybe you start teaching here. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> it's too hot. It's, 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 it's extremely hot in here. Yeah. Oh, Um, where are we? So we started at probably 10 past. Yeah. So maybe we can go to 5 soon. Oh shit, it's already 36. Yeah. Okay. Um, I wonder how the other ones are going. Do you want to check? Yeah, good idea. Yeah, just, just run around. Thanks so much. No, I'm not doing much yet. I am. Um, I will take notes from the discussion. Yeah, yeah. The presentation was. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the first part was really nice. Yeah? Yeah, it was really good. Oh, that's very good. I missed the last one. Yeah. 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 Yeah, Virginia is always great, right? Yeah. I really like how to get a talk. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. We can just look at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 
Your thoughts, and then we'll uh, we'll talk together, okay? Teach me. I have no time. I'm giving people time. 
it's so windy that it never stops. Yeah, it's been recorded. It is recorded. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm sorry to stop you, but uh, what we'd like to do now is to uh, have your attention, but not to us, but to the monitoring and warning we're yeah. probably going to start with. Yeah. Monitoring and warning. Okay. Um, so some of the main uh, issues that we discussed, sort of monitoring and warning, go over. Um, the, the sort of the link between the, the, the data group uh, and trying to actually have open access to that data for use in the forecast. Yes. Yeah. Um, also, trying to uh, generalize from some very site-specific processes and being able to apply those at large scales. Mm -hmm. um, another thing is fast response times. A lot of the models used for forecasting and uh, flood prediction and stuff like that is very computationally expensive. So how do we? Um, provide sort of real-time updates for people in these forecasting uh, situations. Also, uh, using, say, public input via social media oh, yeah. Um, yeah. For, for sort of real-time monitoring, um, that's, it's hard to sort of filter through all the noise and find out relevant sort of signals that we can use to populate our, uh, our uh, forecasts. Um, also, lack of reliable monitoring networks. Uh, and also lack of specialized education programs in a lot of places to produce these young scientists that can yep. tackle these challenges yep. in the future. Yep. Um, and then the legal framework for controlling, or sort of for managing all of this. Yep. Very good. Do you have wow. a top one? What's the one that you really <laughs> think you can contribute to? <laughs> <laughs> There's so many. <laughs> it's a very good one, I think. Yeah, really good one. Well done. Yes, can you comment on that? Uh, okay, so we, we really need that it's a reliable monitoring network to actually work out. Yeah, great. Did I take your sticky note? Do you have a sticky with that? We have loads of stickies. I think it's very beautiful. Wow. wow. That is cool. <laughs> Oh, that's even better. Maybe that's what my idea was. Yeah, sticky tape. Maybe like, you can stick out the sticky tape. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll do that. We'll do that. Oh, yeah, okay. That's Okay. So the next group, what should we do, Liliana? Next one, maybe the risk knowledge? Risk knowledge. Yeah. I love the sticky knowledge. We uh, identified a bunch of risks, mainly through expert input. <laughs> um, one of them was, of course, the use of real-time data. Uh, so not just use one um, time point, in, but try to update mm -hmm. this regularly. Of flood in inundation. Inundation. <laughs> yeah. And one of the um, other ones was the involvement of different local authorities to try to centralize it. So yeah different geographical areas should be included because maybe at some points the risk is not as obvious as others but actually the cost could come from such areas. Yep. Uh, also the um, try to integrate and train um, uh, increase awareness of local uh, people uh, preferentially who are working with authorities so that they actually have more ownership to um, to the systems. Yeah. And then uh, also the one we thought was most interesting and also quite tangible maybe for research is to incorporate land use maps. Mm -hmm. So to identify which areas are um, more important uh, yeah. because there's maybe hospitals or... Yeah, the exposure data. Yeah. Great. And is that your top one? Yes. Yes, okay. Okay, any comments on that? Or we move to the next one? Okay, we go to communication. Can I have a sticky note, please? <laughs> this is my role in life. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. We haven't finished yet, so... Uh, okay. This is the list where we kind of, uh, so far. Um, one of the things is why... Uh, understandable why people don't uh, listen to warnings, don't read warnings. Mm. Yeah. So what's the reason that they, even though they have been warned, 
So in the risk knowledge, you should, we should, I guess, be not just focusing on scientific knowledge, but also, but also yeah, indigenous also knowledge. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's where it also goes wrong a bit, because the, the, the research comes up with, hey, we have all this amazing knowledge, and, yeah. you, and that's a bit where we come with indigenous knowledge, but also the feeling, like the understanding of the local culture. Yeah. Because you can just give them the information, but if yeah. you don't understand how they are feeling yourself, or yeah. what they actually need, because they know a lot more. Yeah. Yeah. So if you miss that gap, we just give them all the scientific uh, warnings yeah. and stuff, yeah. and miss out on how they want to respond. So that's also the trust. Yeah. So they don't feel trusted. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's why they don't get accountable because I'm not going to be able to respond. And I got really good comment from my group, like if you make people like, feel ignorant, yeah. like they will be angry. Yeah. They will not act yeah. in the direction that you yeah. Do you want something to add? I think local, local communities should not be treated as victims, but also as actors. Yeah, yeah, part of the community. solution. Yeah, yeah, part of the yeah. solution. Yeah. I think the terminology for all this is like community-based yeah. disaster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's great. great. Okay, now, we're a bit tight on time. They're going to start flowing in on us quick, okay? So we have to really come up with this <laughs> part. <laughs> so what are we going to do? Oh, did you have your one key gap? Did, did yeah, this one, I wrote yeah. about oh, yeah. understanding, yeah. but I think it's I think but, but also, also a risk knowledge, there are two yeah. things. But it's also the participative participate, yeah. 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I'm going to put So, let's, let's, okay, what is the best way? Um, what can we do about this? So, what do we think as young scientists we can do to try and bridge these gaps? Like, 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 like
Yeah. So we can. I want to focus on each individual one, but now I'm a bit nervous about time. No, Will we focus on one, or what's the best way? Yeah. I've known for experience that if you start at a young age, uh, increasing their awareness since they're kids in school, yeah. when they go older, they're like the motor of the society uh -huh. to actually do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I would say that one of the gaps would be like awareness and not only us young, like, or adults, but yeah. also from the kids. Because a, they're the yeah, future yeah. Too. We're yeah. building a sort of a culture of yeah, misunderstanding, yeah. let's say, from an early... Write down the sticky notes. <laughs> <laughs> then we won't lose it. <laughs> yeah. But what, what can we do? What can we do? Okay, let's, let's look at the then response. What can we do? We can reach out to the local communities and see yeah. if we're there to do that, because we will yeah. also be able to trigger yeah. a different way the, the growth. Yeah. Yeah. So, so youth, local youth. We can engage local youth, but also us as... Scientists can also yeah. conduct research in these communities to try and understand their needs better, to try and understand how they could respond better. Is that a role yeah. that we should be playing? Support uh, better education service for the community. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. You know, the community be aware of yeah. that. Yeah. Service. And also, you know, improve the quality of the education for this and Yeah. 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 They, they want to come in. Okay. So we have a, a communication problem, which is a bit of a risk. We know that it's a risk. So we, we stop, or? Charlie, Mr. Charlie. You know what you can do, so what we is, do? is during, um, during these uh, wonderful final, uh, okay, actually, we need to, somebody needs to give a pitch, actually. That's an important thing. So somebody needs to present what we learned in, uh, in five minutes. Any volunteer? Come on. And somebody. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. Cool. Okay. Okay. Good on you. Okay. Great. <laughs> and, <laughs> and another point is on the back of your sheet, there, there is again this, these four things. If there's more things that you want to write down, if you want to write down what you want to contribute, what you think this you could contribute, write it down and, and give me back the sheet or, or send an email or... Yeah. Yeah, also exchange uh, business cards or emails with uh, the people in your group. That's a good idea. I guess we could help. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
with a one-page document which captures the major findings and especially how you want to proceed. And that is what we need also to get commitment and support from organizations who may have some financial means to support you. So we need a one-page document at the end. Okay? First rapporteur, that is group... Um, Understanding disaster risk. Volunteer? Could you come to the stage, please? Uh, it's, it's okay. It's okay? Yeah. <laughs> you don't listen to me. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we were, we were, uh, we choose uh, four. We only finished three because of the time. So the first one, uh, the first gap we identify is the uh, drivers of risk. As we were talking before, uh, we believe that uh, really natural disaster doesn't exist, and nature has their own flow, and when we uh, set it in cities, then we impact this uh, dynamic. So we want to make, uh, uh, it's needed to uh, make the, the people aware of na nature and society interaction, and how to make it happen. Uh, we were talking about integrate disciplines, into disaster risk reduction, and also we were talking about sharing studies. So if you start talking and sharing with the people, then you can assess also uh, the second point that is risk perception. Uh, so we want to understand how people perceive the risk, what they think, and uh, also 
there are some entities that work up by their own efforts, but they don't take into account community's effort. That is, the, the, the ones that are facing the, the main challenges. So after uh, how to make it happen, uh, we integrate local and external experts. Uh, we tell the locals, we gave them um, uh, tools to, to understand and to assess and to reduce the risk. And with our energy and passion, we make them uh, more aware and we share experience with them. The third uh, gap we have is entertain this assessment into actions. So this assessment uh, usually use uh, complex uh, definitions, and so make it grounded so everybody can understand and can uh, be empowered of uh, the actions. So we have co-creation of risk map, uh, map plans um, and shift the paradigm that we have about co-creation. So we propose a new approach where we integrate not only uh, different disciplines, but also we as a young uh, scientist, we can bring also new perspectives and uh, approaches to uh, reduce the risk. Sounds very good. <laughs> very good, thank you. A brief question about do you have already a concrete context in mind, a city or, or neighborhood or some location where you want to? Okay, well, uh, right now I'm working, uh, I'm studying at IHF, I'm doing the master there, and I'm working in a case in Cali, in Colombia. <coughs> and, uh, currently, the municipality is trying to do a uh, they have a <coughs> crossing the city, and they, they are doing uh, several. Uh, efforts to recover the, to restore the river basins, but they, they need the community to, to participate. <coughs> so right now I'm assessing this protection from households mm -hmm. to understand if they already been uh, working by themselves to uh, secure their, their houses. And also we want to understand if they are willing to collaborate either pay with money or taxes or with the labor or the effort to assess this uh, recovery in this nature basis. Great. What do you need to make this happen, this idea? Well, actually, I'm going in June to Colombia to yeah. assess the risk potential. So I'm going to do questionnaires and surveys to yeah. understand what they think and what are actually the urgencies that make them uh, act. Yeah. yeah, so if you assess what they need and what are the main things that is constraining their behavior or yeah. or maybe, maybe encourage their behavior towards a protective action, yeah. then you can uh, yeah. give some recommendations to the municipality from, well, from this information they can assess and they can influence their perception. So that's what I'm planning to do, like yeah. uh, trying to understand the gap between these And how do you involve this? this Family? We yeah. are the power for us for this. So. <laughs> 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 okay, but then the question: What do you need to engage this this valuable resource in in, in this endeavor? What do, how do you get them? Involved? Yeah, I think we all have a, a lot of knowledge, and uh, we have to start sharing experiences to understand how they assess and uh, how they do it in Africa, but how they do it in South America, yeah. and how they do it in uh, Europe. So I think this is the most uh, plus for being here, like understand how everybody's thinking and which is the best option to assess these things. Wonderful. We Thank hear more from you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. In the, the next group, Disaster Risk Governance. Who is the rapporteur? Well, okay. <laughs> so okay. We're, okay, I'll do it. Uh, we were the governance group, but uh, we suffered governance failure. Uh, <laughs> 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 so I, uh, I facilitated it, and I'm going to improvise and go off of impressions. Uh, so we talked a lot about um, the how vague um, global governance mandates and, and policies are, and the difficulties of actually intervening um, because of the technical language and the being uh, so one of the, the, the good uh, the, a major intervention here is to act as a science policy intermediary to translate between what we learn in classes how we interact with professors in different academic institutions translate that knowledge into a context based or locally applicable uh, 
information so that we can communicate between science and policy, but it's a co-beneficial model in a sense. It's not just um, uh, students and young scientists contributing to translating information into, uh, uh, it's both ways. Uh, 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 policymakers can also learn from uh, student knowledge uh, who are often come from diverse backgrounds, culturally different backgrounds, who can contribute back into providing that um, information asset in, in policy making and governance at the global level, but also at different levels. Um, and um, a couple other points, random points. Um, youth is not a monolithic uh, population. There's a lot of diversity in it. And I think uh, one of the conclusions we had was that we can harness that diversity um, in not just mobilizing um, from different places around the world, in, in mobilizing, mobilizing for awareness, about things like Sendai or other governance, but also mobilizing in terms of disseminating the information and the toolkits that are coming out of these global protocols and policies because there is a gap in, in knowledge. Um, maybe because technology differences, people don't always know how to Google uh, certain terms, uh, so we need to figure out different technological pathways of disseminating information, social media, we do that really good at that, or other technology processes but also other um, indigenous traditional kind of local processes um, that um, may be more applicable for uh, communities that lack that technological connection. Um, so there's a lot of different ideas floating around of how to be and, and be an effective intermediary uh, between policymakers and, and users, but also uh, communities that are uh, uh, experiencing the risk of the ground level. There may be other points, but I forgot. May, may I try yeah, to yeah, yeah. summarize a bit? Yes, because please, it's please. It's yeah. very eloquent yeah. and, and I don't know about that. But yeah. if frankly saying, a lot of policy documents emerged from this conference are very difficult to understand. They, they, and, there's and a lot of talk about indicators, uh, monitoring. So you want to challenge them to write it in, I would say, I think that's in a knowledge which can be understood by anybody. Yeah. That is what we want. Communication. I think that is a Brilliant, brilliant challenge for a young professional. Absolutely great. What do you need to make that happen? Um, the uh, training in, uh, it's a, maybe I'm just going to take one example. It's uh, a human capital approach maybe to, to have the training, to be able to be effective communicators, um, to have the training around media, around writing, around all that, all those skills. <laughs> great. Now yesterday we had a leadership yeah. Training exactly. and uh, once you were there, and what we learned mm -hmm. is that the power of Christina uh, yeah. was that yeah. she said, "I don't know how we can resolve this problem. Exactly. Let's do it together." So if you are saying as young professionals, we don't understand what you are saying, please explain better. I think that's very powerful. That is leadership. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Okay, then the next group, that is about eco-VRR. Who is the uh, rapporteur? Ah! We actually have two groups, and my, my group at Optime, we only do three or four points. Um, we first looked at how the topic is addressed in the disaster risk reduction, and um, we came to the conclusion that building in nature only gets marginal attention, and the attention is growing, but um, um, it's actually also a thing that we always do. Like in the history, you see that we always have built big nature. And they are now trying to sell us a new label as a revolution to build big nature. And we came to the conclusion that, yeah, it is actually not really a new thing. We are always, we have always built big nature. Um, so we indicated the key research development um, that we can do now better, make better cost-benefit analysis, and the cost-benefit analysis analyzes are one of the most important things to, to do and to make decisions on. Um, but that, yeah, this, this cost-benefit analysis is also uh, a gap because the benefits of green infrastructure are still really, um, really hard to determine. Because how do you determine uh, a walk in a park after a stress day? How do you determine the value of that? The value is dependent on, on the quality of the park, but also on your personal uh, state. So are you stressed or do you need it? Or are you completely re relaxed? So that makes it really difficult to express the benefits. 
and that is a, is a gap, and that's also why uh, why the decisions are often done in hard infrastructure. Um, that, that was the conclusion that we. Uh, so what are you going to do about it? <laughs> that's a good question. Um, I, there are a lot of kids to make good estimations of the benefits, uh, but I think they can be really they can be improved and they can be made even better. Um, and because yeah, the investments are still done in, in hard infrastructure most of the time, so probably they are not not good enough. The, the evidence that the benefits are real is probably still a little bit uncertain. So yeah, they have to be improved. But how? I don't really know for sure. Better indicators? Yeah, better indicators, more detail. But you as a young scientist, how can you contribute? Um, I think that we still have to share the idea among young people that we have to build with nature and use eco-based solutions. Mm -hmm. And I think the idea, and, and by spreading that idea, uh, we are making a kind of new movement and I think it's very important that as many as young people know this, this movement and know and, and understand the benefits of building the nature. Because the young pe people are becoming yeah, the future leaders and the future policy makers. So when they know that, it will move forward. There is a second uh, the second group actually, maybe one of them can yeah. it. Well, I'm representing my young man. <laughs> 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 Not their part, sorry. <laughs> But, um, well, we also just covered mainly three questions and we did look, we of course recognize a direct connection between native-based solutions and the ERA, that was kind of not the question, but um, we saw many parties active uh, with it, uh, but still we feel that they are not working towards one common goal or uh, that this uh, cooperation could be a bit more structured. And that's because, uh, the, the challenge we, we see, of course, is it, it's an innovation. Though you say we have built in the past nature, but the way we construct infrastructures the last 50 years is completely not taking nature into account. So it, this is an innovation, mm -hmm. and therefore it's, it's still a challenge to uh, people perceive it's more expensive, uh, less predictable. So uh, the, we see main gaps also in how to do the risk management of this uh, infrastructure, uh, how to monetize uh, the benefit, and the, the type of solutions these are require so many disciplines that make it extra <laughs> challenging, mm -hmm. uh, and more involvement of uh, local stakeholders, and, and, and because they also need to be customized. So how, in you know, the middle of all that complexity, uh, to still uh, get to guidelines and standards. That is how engineers are used to mm -hmm. decide. Um, we see a lot of opportunities also there for young scientists because as Tim was saying from her experience, uh, is that uh, when you want to involve communities, they, are, they feel young scientists much more accessible and they will trust them more to really tell what they think versus a senior or professor. So, there is, there is one. <laughs> well, I guess you have all that in Thailand, maybe. <laughs> and then, um, and then uh, one thing we would like, uh, if I'm taking uh, it right, is that therefore, how come these different disciplines represented by young scientists work together, uh, maybe some kind of pressure cooker, so I should just say, how can we tick all the boxes uh, that great infrastructure? to get finance, implemented and finance, or the other way around. <laughs> um, and, and I really see, okay, my discipline is important, but, but what input do I give to your discipline? And, and, and make that much more structured. Mm -hmm. that yeah. Wonderful. Thank you very much. So, so I, I read from, your, from both your, your feedbacks is that, say, you have the old economy, we still govern this type of important uh, decisions about infrastructure. You need a new economy, a new appreciation of values. That's what you are pleading for, right? is it? Yes or no? <laughs> yes or no? I um, mean, today, yes, we do need to appreciate the benefits in, in a different way, but risk management for infrastructure investment won't go away. And we don't want it to go away because it's our future. Yes. Yes.
but, but we need to yeah. then structure this knowledge so as to give answer. Yeah. 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 But in, in my feeling, if I make an interpretation by what you're saying, like the old professional and the young professional, that the old professionals are the problem, not the young professional, I think it's the same holds here. Yeah. The, the economy and the economic models we, which are governing our decisions are not taking that new economy into account. And I think if you have a strong voice and say this needs to be uh, appreciated in those models, I think it's just a suggestion of an uh, old professor. <laughs> okay, <laughs> last speaker. Last, uh, that is you. Okay. <laughs> um, so for the, uh, for the early warning uh, group, uh, the main uh, sort of things that we looked at in developing the early warning system are the, the risk knowledge, so what kind of data do we need to make effective predictions, uh, monitoring and warning, so how, how do we actually keep track of and predict these uh, events, and uh, we also have communication and dissemination, so how do you actually communicate those messages and warnings to the public, and then response capability, how do we respond, and so we identified there's there's definitely big technical gaps in terms of availability of data um, and also the being able to monitor in real time what's going on and the, the technology and we need to be able to make those predictions. But also another huge gap is on the human side of it. How do you make people listen and then how do you also engage in the communities so that you can actually get an effective response? Um, and so we looked at things like how do you, uh, you know, use indigenous knowledge and uh, to gain local trust by working with communities um, in order to better respond to these things. Um, how do you, uh, it, you know, improve your data collection and make this data more open so that more people can use it? Um, how do you do things like, on a technical side, you speed up your modeling so that you can make these predictions in real time? And how do you get people to listen and actually really respond and feel like they have a stake in this and they can be part of the solution too? Um, and uh, really, so it really just comes down to the relationship between the science um, behind all this forecasting and people and how do, you, how do you make that interaction work for everybody. Okay, and what do we need? To make it happen. Uh, well, I mean, on the technical side, you know, we need uh, we do need more data for everything, and we need we need better systems. But I think what we also need to do is to to demonstrate the value of these early warning systems to get more buy-in to build that larger network of data that we need. But at the same time, we need more than just the technical side. And I think uh, people, especially other professionals, need to build those bridges between other disciplines and uh, to be able to, to make connections and engage with people and to, to find sort of unlikely synergies with other disciplines and just see what kind of solutions you can come up with that way. Do you have already a project in mind which you would like to uh, well, start? Well, I'm, I'm doing my research on uh, flooding on uh, low-lying tropical islands in the Pacific and trying to develop an early warning system for those. And so that's an instance where you have many different islands, diverse cases, and uh, things like the fresh water supply is under major threat. And how do you um, how do you make a response that's appropriate for each of these individual locations, which are very unique, but that's still effective from the top down? Yeah. And but also, what can you learn from the bottom up from these people who've been living there and have to yeah. deal with these problems? Do you see uh, opportunities to engage this family? Yeah, well, I, and absolutely. I think that there's. I think one of the good things about this field is that, and the risk reduction, is that there's a lot of lessons learned that people from different fields, people working in, um, say, coastal engineering or hydrology or, or other inland things, or even just outside of water-based science or in, in other um, disciplines, that we can all apply different approaches and, uh, and use those unique perspectives to try and solve these problems together. I think, so. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Well done. Now, I'd honor to announce a senior professional who was a third of my Virginia. A very difficult name, Korsmas Goemans. And he is one of the leaders in disaster risk management in the Netherlands. So, please give your feedback. I'm going to stand up. We have a bit of overview. He has said some closing remarks on science and policy. Uh, I will go through it, pick some things out of it, and I try to combine it in the end with a kind of mindset or a scheme that can help you in your scientific career. First of all, I'm very happy to be here. In my ministry, I'm in the, the mentorship of young trainees coming in. 
and we learn a lot from each other. So intergenerational working groups or intergenerational discussions, that works. I know it because I've done it. But it's not enough. I find out that we, all the professionals, doesn't uh, listen enough to the young professionals because they see the gaps and they ask them questions. Why are you doing this? And why not that? The professional can give answers from his experience, from the system, things like that. And together you can find a solution. And most of it, it's innovative. And you bring that in. Well, let's start. I'm very happy with this event uh, because I'm also chair of implementing Sendai in Europe. We try to find out what are the topics and what are the actions to be taken in the next five years. We are working on it now with all the colleagues from all the European countries. One of the themes of the seven we put on paper was combining networks especially adaptation and disaster risk reduction. This is a good example of it. It's the start of it. So, I'm glad for that. Another topic that we have is governance. Well, governance was one of the main themes in it. Risk assessment is the third theme that we put on the agenda for Europe. It's part of it. So, those elements are, I think, for me, that is here in this small conference, uh, stressed that we have the good points on the agenda. Her, uh, learning that from you as young scientific professionals. And then we have this. I worked on it, this with, with my colleagues from all the other countries, and Virginia and I, it's our Bible. <laughs> when I'm in the office and people come with an ID, we have to put on the agenda this or that, then I ask, is it somewhere in here? If not, no. <laughs> if yes, let's see how we can make it work. So, this is the Bible, I think, at least for the next 15 years. So, that's one point. Uh, what I've seen. So, Virginia with the Bible. Aniska with intergenerational working together, coordination. The alumni worldwide uh, with passion on uh, knowing what to do and why we do it. Monitoring programming. And then the understanding the risk. The governance. I, f I find some equal things in, in, in what you presented in the European Forum Disaster Risk Reduction with my colleagues of all the national platforms we find something about governance what do we do about it? it's a topic and we used uh, well, a scheme of the World Bank to, to organize it a bit and we produced as a few colleagues among each other how can we better perform on governance using a kind of scheme. So I give a bit of the World Bank has a scheme, and it's not a, a ticket box or something, but it gives you ideas how you can perform on governance. A good example of that, uh, our cabinet asked OECD to look at the governance structure of uh, water management in the Netherlands. I think two years ago, they delivered a report fit for the future, and in my words, well, it's okay. But no awareness raising. And that's one of your themes here today, awareness raising. Well, in, in my country, uh, my colleagues at the ministry and colleagues of infrastructure work together, they raised a website, uh, our minister Schultz uh, was there for the papers on the Maasland caring starting uh, a new campaign for uh, raising awareness and started uh, an app about do I flood, put in your postal code and you can see how the water level is rising in your uh, house 
with suggestions what to do. So those are the things that, that that's that's working. Building with nature. <coughs> it's another one. Uh, Margrethe Wallström once said, and I heard it today, there are no natural disasters. They are all man-made. If you are not going to live in a deltaic area, then you don't have problems with floodings. So, that's a good thing to have in mind. It's socio-economic. We do it ourselves. Uh, and we had a presentation about clean water and, and, and uh, diseases. I want to conclude uh, on that with, with a scheme. I think it's, it's quite simple. It's all hazard. It's all society, business, government, NGOs, science, all society. And you have to look at the crisis management cycle. So if you think there's a problem, you have to ask you first, what are the risks? If you have that on paper, the risks, then you can inform other people in other silos, hey, here we have the risks. In my silo, it's a problem. Because in, or perhaps in your silo, you have part of the solution. So interdisciplinary, as we are here, that's key. It doesn't make things easier. Because people are not used working together with different silos, or different ministries, or different NGOs, or different academic uh, communities. But we have to start. And I see here a big example of the start. So, a scheme on which part of the crisis management cycle are you working on, doing your science work. And another part that I heard today is indigenous people. Go to local level. They know what's going on. Do your science there. There you can learn what should be done. And if that's on 40 or 50 spots in the world, then it's really a problem. You can generate it and put it on a higher agenda. So it's very worthwhile that you have your science, social science, technical science, the science in, in your field of water. I think uh, those are the remarks that I wanted to make. The crisis management cycle, whole society, whole generation, multidisciplinary. And I'd like to thank you all because uh, you're a boiling pot of energy. <laughs> and, and science energy and engagement and especially in DRR and as National Focal Point DRR I'm glad that there are so many young scientists coming to help us to make a better world, a sustainable world, cradle to cradle, green infrastructure, things like that. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Christmas. Thank you. Before we come to a closure, Virginia would like to make a call, but, and then we have some words at the end, yeah? This has been such a wonderful meeting. I cannot tell you how much it inspired us. And I think Lydia, Nisha, all of you are just amazing. But the one thing that I thought was Nancy's talk was pretty incredible. And I thought her message that we were not superheroes by working at home, but that we needed a network really inspired us to not join you for your space because we were having to the base of our own. So Nancy and I thought that we would share with you an opportunity 
to write with us a peer review paper, one of you should be a leader. So we're looking for one of you to help us lead because you've all got too much to do. So we thought valuing the power of networks for science and technology for the implementation of the Sunday framework would be a short concept note, not a systematic literature review, about all the things that Nancy's talking about and I'm struggling to implement in the SCT framework. Now, Case has agreed to help us with it, and so has Chris, but we didn't get to all of you because you were busy. So we wondered if one of you wanted to put your hand up and try and lead on this with Nancy, obviously facilitating it and well support, but I really wanted to hear if there was one of you who'd like to be involved, because I think this will help us not only to drive your network, but to drive the other networks, even the one that Tom has just been talking about. So, Cosmos, and I think that is going to be really important about how we try and show the value of networks. Um, but the other thing that we thought was very important, we mentioned commitment, investment, and delivering a clear value. And I thought that was one of the things that came up because I'm quite worried about getting money for you to make sure you continue and really get some, you, you get some funding to do the work for you. So this is why we thought we might just suggest it to you. So that's why we're going to have a photograph. One of you might want to, one, two of you might want to say, gosh, this is a great idea. I'd like to be involved. I'll get you some food for you, whoever I am. Nancy, that's on my list. I made my pitch. <laughs> so, well, no, thank you very much. I think it's it's correct. It's the way forward. Because just the idea of having a network is not enough. We need to make it happen. Yeah. And uh, again, it's it's about young scientists. So we would really like one or more of you involved. It doesn't have to be one. So, uh, yeah. Well, there's, wow. OK, we've yeah. had three good hands up. Yeah. So would you like to talk between yourselves who'd like to do it? But it will need a bit of time. But we need to get it done fast. So there's Robert, Juliana, Nyan, and Keith. Okay, so would you three of you like to see who's got the time to do it? Because I'd like to get this out ready within a couple of months you know, to, to appear in New Journal. I just think it, it would help us to articulate what we're trying to do. And we don't think it's been written before. Certainly not for the same way. And if more of you want to get engaged as a contributing author, you can see I have a contributing author habit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Anyway, apart from this ne next activity we currently agree upon, there was also a notion that to sustain and, and, and strengthen this, this family, uh, we need to have a facility. Uh, to really support it. And to have that facility, we need to have money. In order to get money, we need to have from you a statement of what you really need. Now, our suggestion was is that we extract from this discussion a one page document which really supports continuing your work. Yeah. And that document we will use the seniors, like Cosmos and Virginia, and Nancy. You are not a senior, you are in between. <laughs> and then, so I will keep you posted on that, because I think that will be a conditional uh, step, I would say. Is there somebody who has a burning question? Or a remark? Go on like this. Go on like this. <laughs> and again, I would like to thank the two great young people. I was really impressed by you because it was so hard to work with those old grey professionals like Case and myself who had no time for you and, 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 and you were really so persistent and thanks again for your wonderful work. And you had some small gifts for yeah. to Yeah, I have some little things that I managed to take from the stars. This is a, a, a USB key of the Delta Film that was recently opened in Delta Arc, so I would like to give uh, one oh, of wow. you. Oh, wow! Thank you! <laughs> and uh, this is just a little keychain that I can give to the facilitators. Uh, Eric? <laughs> uh, who else do we have? Uh, remind me. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yourself? Yeah, no, yeah, no. No, who else? Uh, Andreas. 
Well, okay, Phil Powers, so I don't know. <laughs> We have maybe uh, we think a bit more about the gaps, we think more about what, what role we can do as young scientists, and we come up with some key actions uh, that we want to take, and we can feed that to that one pager, and then they can try and get us the resources to do it. So I think uh, that's a good way to go forward. Okay. Yeah, and Anita great. just wants to say one this one. Want to say something? If you have, I, I want to steal your language. Burning question about the platform. Please do not hesitate to send an email. The email is already in the, uh, in the flyer, um, and you can ask anything um, and see how how we can go with the platform together. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Good picture. Downstairs in the garden. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Good. <laughs>